For the sermon today, we've been having a great time in our sermon series, All In, which is a chapter-by-chapter journey through the book of Joshua. Of all the characters in the Bible, Joshua has this all-in attitude. And I hope and pray that you will develop that all-in attitude as well as you stick with us through this, this journey in Scripture that we're on. And today we're in chapters six and seven of Joshua, and we're going to be looking at the subject of sin in the camp. Joshua six and seven, and the subject of sin in the camp. It's the troubling story of Achan and his precious but doomed family. This scripture underscores the gravity of sin and the impact that it can have upon an entire family, upon an entire community upon an entire nation. We make so little of sin, but God makes so much of it. This story picks up in Joshua chapter six. When the Israelites were giddy with joy, they had just won a miraculous victory over the formidable and evil enemy of Jericho, the Canaanite city-state. You remember last week how the Canaanites practiced torture and infant sacrifice and perverse religious practices, temple prostitution. They they were kind of like ISIS today. And you probably also remember from last week how the Lord won the battle over Jericho for the Israelites. He instructed them to march around the city once each day for six days. As they marched, they were to carry the Ark of the Covenant with them, that famous box that held the law of God. It represented God's presence and power wherever they went. And also as they marched around Jericho, the priests were to take trumpets representing praise and worship. Once around the city, each day for six days. And then on the seventh day, they were instructed to march seven times around the city. And then reading in Joshua 6, verse 16, the seventh time around, when the priests sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the army, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. And the walls came down, and the Israelites rushed to the city, and every member of this godless, perverse, violent culture of Jericho perished, except for Rahab and her family, because she had protected the Israelites. God determined that this was to be a total destruction. No spoils were to be taken. In verse 19, the only loot that was allowed to be kept was the silver, gold, bronze, and iron, but these were to be considered from this city devoted to God taken to the treasury to be used for the worship of the Lord. None was to be taken personally. And things were going so well. The victory over Jericho was complete. God was at work. God was in control. It was like the Garden of Eden. Nothing could go wrong. Except for this one thing, humans. Leave it to humans to mess things up. Unbeknownst to Joshua, in chapter seven, verse seven, the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. And just like the fruit in the Garden of Eden, these forbidden items, these riches of Jericho begin to entice a man named Achan and his family. This teaches us a few things about sin. First of all, forbidden things entice sinful people. Forbidden things entice sinful people. Just like the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. The Lord says, this garden is yours. You can do anything you want to do. There's just this one fruit of the tree. You can eat from any tree. You can eat anything you want to. You can do anything. There's just this one fruit 
of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're not to eat that fruit. And all of a sudden that just became the one thing that Adam and Eve were obsessed with. Just don't eat of that tree. You can, you can carve your initials in that tree. You can hang a tire swing in that tree, but just don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the fact that it was forbidden made it even more enticing. And the fact that the spoils of Jericho were forbidden could have made it even more enticing to this man, Achan. He thought, man, those are forbidden. That means there's some spice that I'm missing out on, that there's some fulfillment that I'm missing out on. And, And we even know the articles that he took. They're listed in verse 21. First of all, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold. It was forbidden, but it was enticing. And like the other Israelites, Achan had been a poor former slave wandering in the wilderness and right there at hand, this much loot, this much wealth, what more could he imagine? This is my security. This is my fulfillment. This is, this is everything that I've always wanted. And his mind was drunk with desire for these items. And so he takes them and it leads to his destruction. Much like Esau and Jacob. Remember, Jacob had been out in the fields hunting and, and um, Esau had been out in the fields hunting and he comes home and, and, uh, and he says, give me some of that, give me some of that, that, that bean soup. Jacob, I'm dying of hunger. Give me some of that bean soup. And Jacob says, well, sell me your birthright. And folks, Folks, we we think it's absolutely delusional, but Esau, for a bowl of pottage, sold his inheritance. We think that's crazy today, but many people have committed the sin of Esau today, selling their heritage for a moment of pleasure. Feed the flesh for a moment, lose a lifetime of blessing. Feed the flesh for a moment, lose a family. Feed the flesh for a moment, lose a career, forbidden things entice sinful people. It was forbidden. And secondly, opportunity entices sinful people. Forbidden things entice sinful, it was forbidden, so it enticed them, and now it was the opportunity. The the, the riches were right there for the taking. Right there at hand. This was a sin of opportunity. This wasn't a sin where you had to get in the car and drive to the Krispy Kreme donut place and get that donut and eat it. This is that donut that's right there in Sunday school. It's right there calling your name. Toby, eat me. I'm great. And we take it and we eat it. And this lavish wealth was right there in front of Achan enticing him there for the taking calling out to Achan I'm here riches untold make me your own these riches were forbidden making them all the more spicy and tempting and the wealth was right there at hand enticing calling Achan's name and then thirdly excuses entice sinful people Oh, the devil will freely supply you with good excuses to sin. Achan may have, told, may have told himself that this was no big deal. Jericho was a rich city full of wealth. He may have told himself that no one would miss it. Folks, those are the devil's words. No, it's no big deal. No one's going to miss it. Or the excuse, it's not so bad. These are the devil's words. The devil will always supply you with good excuses not to do God's will. But sin is always worse than any excuse. Sin always takes you farther than you ever wanted to go. Sin always costs you more than you ever wanted to pay. And then, of course, the excuse, no one will ever know. That leads us to the fourth thing. Isolation entices sinful people. But of course, nowhere in the Bible does it say 
that the other Israelites didn't know. Folks, all that loot is difficult to lug across a battlefield back to your tent. So maybe there were other Israelites that knew about it, but they just turned a blind eye. That may have been the case because it seemed as though the Lord was mad at the whole nation of Israel for this sin. So maybe it wasn't the excuse, no one will ever know. Maybe they did know. Maybe it was the excuse of no one will ever tell. You see, sin spreads. And Achan's sin spread to all of Israel. And then at the next battle, the smaller city of Ai, they just were gonna send a few thousand people up to take it. But the Israelites experienced an unexpected and humiliating defeat. They lost the battle. Reading in Joshua chapter seven, verse four, about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. And then in verse six, Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, alas, sovereign Lord, why did you ever bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? And then in verse 11, the Lord reveals the reason why. He said in verse 11, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things they have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. And that is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. So then in verse 16, early the next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes and Judah was chosen. The clans of Judah came forward and the Zerahites were chosen He had the clan of Zerahites to come forward by families and Zimri was chosen. Joshua had his family come forward man by man and Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah was chosen. And then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel and honor him Tell me what you have done. Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, it is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I've done. When I saw in the plunder a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver, and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then in verse 25, Joshua said to Achan, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all the Israels All of Israel stoned him and his family and they burned their bodies and they heaped a large pile of rocks over Achan. You can read all about it 
in chapter 7. Folks, back then, even as today, evidently there was the death penalty for treason during the time of war. Even back then, giving aid and comfort to the enemy, causing a battle to be lost, causing dozens of soldiers' lives to be lost. That seems severe, doesn't it? But nothing's changed today. Not just back then, but then for us today, there is a death penalty for sin. And there is an eternal death penalty for sin and disobedience to God. So we're hard on Achan, but we have all committed the same sin he did, which is knowing God's will, but then directly disobeying him. Romans 3.23 says it this way, not just Achan, but all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, not just Achan's sin, but any sin, the wages of sin is death. Maybe you're not lusting after gold and silver, but maybe you're coveting a neighbor's possessions. Maybe you have envy in your heart. Maybe you're not stealing items from a battlefield, but you're robbing God of his tithes and offerings. Maybe you're not burying loot in your tent, but you have hidden sins that you've buried in your heart that you think no one else knows about but God alone. Envy buried in your heart, lust buried in your heart, addictions, pornography, and a whole host of other sins that you bury in your heart. Some of you treasure them like they're buried treasure, but in reality, they're buried landmines that will maim you and destroy you. Achan may have told himself that this was a small sin. No one would ever notice, but God always notices. And sin is always bigger than you ever could imagine. Sin is always more destructive than you could ever imagine. Sin's always greater than what you could ever imagine. And so sins, Achan's sin spread to his family. In fact, they were co-conspirators. So they too were charged with treason. And when they were executed, Achan probably thought, I never intended for it to go this far. But folks, there's no private sin. It always affects your family. There is no private sin. It always spreads to your community. You may have a sin so private that you think no one knows and no one ever will know. But while you are nursing that private sin, that's time that you have could have spent going to battle in prayer for your family. While you're coddling that sin, it's the time that you could have been spending being a redemptive force in your community. Sin always affects others. It always takes you farther than you wanted to go. As I mentioned before, sin thrills, but then it kills. Sin fascinates, but then it assassinates. Sin always takes you farther than you ever wanted to go. Sin always leaves you there longer than you ever wanted to stay. Sin always costs you more than you ever wanted to pay. Sin causes Christians to lose battles. And sin causes those without Jesus Christ to ultimately lose the war. You may have a million to one chance of winning the South Carolina lottery, but you can never win when you play the sin game. And if there's one thing I want you to remember from today's message, it's this. Folks, we are in a war. And the troubling fate of Achan and his family are the kinds of things that happen in war. And we're in a war today. And like many Christians, instead of being faithful warriors, we're somewhat like Achan, thieves living off the spoils of the world when we should be recipients of the treasures of God. But folks, this is South Maine. We always end on a message of hope. And God's word always ends on a message of hope. And the message of hope is this. Israel came back from their sin and they started winning victory after victory after victory. You'll see this next week that they acknowledged their sin and repented. They dealt with their sin decisively and they experienced God's mercy and renewal. 
and they begin to win battles again, living in victory. And that's the subject of next week's message entitled, Coming Back from Sin. We have a special guest preacher, John Austin Robertson. And I hope we have more in attendance than ever to hear his important message. I can't believe that John Austin has never preached here yet, but we are so excited for John Austin Robertson to preach that message that I really want to preach. Man, I'm jealous of him. Great message, coming back from sin. So what's the takeaway from all this? Do you feel like you've sinned and are losing the battle and need to live in victory again? You can today. You can change course. The key starts and ends with a person, Jesus Christ. God who came in the flesh to dwell among us, to love us, to teach us, and to call us to himself. Salvation and victory are yours if you just receive him. Let us pray. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed and every person is praying, what does receiving Christ mean? It, it just simply means like receiving somebody into your house, you just open the door and say, come in. And even though the Lord made you, he loves you, he died for you, he rose for you, he still waits until you invite him in. Receiving Christ is just in prayer. Prayer is simply talking to God. You just say, Lord, come into my heart. Be my Lord, be my savior. I've been running my own life, but I'm ready for you now to run my life. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sins and now help me always to live for you. Thank you for rising from the grave. And now I know that if I trust in you, this life isn't the end, it's just the beginning. Lord, I'm tired of losing battles. I wanna win victory after victory by coming over to the winning side, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, I pray that many people here who are already Christians, who are still hiding sin in their heart, that today would be a, a day of rededication for them. But I pray for those who are here today who still need to begin a relationship with you, that this would be the day that they finally say, yes, Jesus, like Joshua, I'm all in. I'm all in for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.